On this special episode of Movie Geeks United, we welcome the legendary screenwriter Herman Raucher. In a career that spanned nearly five decades, Mr. Raucher penned the screenplays for such notable films as Sweet November, Ode to Billy Joe, Other Side of Midnight, and Watermelon Man, but he is perhaps best known for his screenplay contribution for one of the biggest grossing films of its year, The Summer of 42, and its 1973 sequel, The Class of 44. Mr. Rauscher, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the show. Well, thank you. I, let's go. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, so uh, I'd like, just like for you to tell us a little bit about how you got started. I know you uh, did some uh, work with the uh, some of those live te- some of those television dramas uh, in the early fifties, the Alcoa Hour and the Goodyear Playhouse and Matinee Theater and some of those things. And I'd just like uh, for you to tell us a little bit how you uh, got from uh, uh, into writing uh, for television uh, and how your career got started. Well, television was very early in the in the fifties, and it was started. The, the live playwrights were started by Patty Chayefsky, whom we all know, mm-hmm. and uh, they called them slice of life dramas. They were one hour shows, and I I watched a couple of them, and I said, I think I can do that. And I tried my hand, and I got my usual rejections, and then. Uh, one of them worked, and it gave birth to a couple others. And I was holding down a job in advertising at the same time and too insecure to uh, let either of them go. Uh, so I did both for a while, and uh, eventually I, w- I ended up working for Walt Disney out in Burbank doing his advertising for him. It was As they were going into live dramas, they were... Mm-hmm. Always animated, but uh, Walt was uh, moving on, and Disneyland and Davy Crockett. It was all very exciting. And then I got back into advertising. I just kept going in different directions and ending up on my feet somehow. And uh, at, a, at a certain point, I got fired from a big ad job, which uh, turned out to be providential because it made me concentrate totally on my writing. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that's that's the way it happened. It was a strange parabola, but it worked. Interesting, very very interesting. I, I'm always curious about the trajectory of a person's career and how they how they make that leap. And uh, I, I think you were in the military before you uh, got into I advertising. Was, uh, well, no, I was working at Fox, at 20th Century Fox in New York, where all their ad- advertising was done, and I was drafted in ni- 1950. That, oh, I didn't okay. go my own free will. <laughs> they, they called for me, and I said, here, and they said, you come over here, and uh, we embraced, and I was in the Army for a couple of years and uh, served with great lack of distinction, and... Uh, I don't know. Things, things sort of just uh, peeled and like an onion, and and there was always something else. Uh, it was uh, it was as we say, cool. It was fun. No, yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah, I knew, uh, and I'd forgotten that you did work at Fox for a while. I did some research and, and saw that, and I had totally forgotten that fact. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up again. Uh, now, when you got into writing the uh, television dramas, I'm, I'm curious if you actually uh, had any interactions with Patty Chayefsky, since he was uh, so uh, so prolific at that time and so involved. I didn't know if you ever got to meet him or had any memories of him, if you did. I have a very strong memory of him. We were both nominated for a Best uh, Original Screenplay uh, uh, for uh, the uh, Academy Awards, and uh, he was sitting next to me when he was announced as the winner. <laughs> That's how I met him, and the next morning he took all his congratulatory phone calls at my table, mm-hmm. and he was a very funny guy, and... and uh, He let us all. There were some marvelous writers who came out of TV in those days, (laughs) and uh, and Patty was uh, he was the forerunner, really. 
Yeah, I forgot you guys were both in the running in, uh, for the 1972 Academy Awards ceremony. Uh, you for, obviously, Summer of 42, and he for the hospital. So That's right. I, and I had totally, totally forgotten about that. So, yeah, those are two excellent scripts. I, 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 I'm, I'm glad I wasn't the one having to vote there because I'm not sure what I would have done. <laughs> it would have been well, a he told choice. me, he said, if, if you want to win an Academy Award, write a two-minute speech for George C. Scott. <laughs> which is what he did in hospital, and uh, Scott delivered, and uh, and Patty won another Oscar. He had a few of them. <laughs> yeah, he wound up uh, going on to win the one in 76 for Network, uh, famously also, and had previously done Marty. So, yeah, he was uh, and gone way too soon. I, I just think it's very sad that he passed in 1981, and it would have been interesting to see what he would have done had he lived longer, but... Unfortunately, we'll we'll never know. Um, so I mean, everybody understood that uh, he was the best at his trade in those days, and he was certainly the first one to break through. And there were some young directors came out of television too. Uh, there was a lot of guys who were just like Bob Mulligan, who did Summer '42, was explains that uh, he was sweeping up some place, and somebody said, "Who wants to direct?" And he raised his hand. <laughs> became a director, and uh, <laughs> the way he worked. Did you know uh, Mr. Mulligan before Summer of 42? Did you meet him uh, during the, the days when you were pinning those those television dramas? I never met him. He was doing um, movies before I started writing television. He's a okay. little old. Man. But yeah, uh, he was a decent, really marvelous guy, and, and I miss him. Yeah, I I was a big fan of his work. Uh, uh, obviously, Summer of '42, but I think you know there's To Kill a Mockingbird, and I think uh, the other his adaptation of the Thomas Tryon novel is very yeah. underrated, and I think it's just uh, tremendous. Uh, but yes, so so I understand that you did uh, the Pioneer Go Home, uh, which served My as. Uh, Where did you find that one? <laughs> I just did some research. <laughs> Well, I was I was struggling at uh, 20th Century Fox. I was very young, and I was making very little money. And someone said, you could make a good buck by working in the amateur theater where you take a, a book and you turn it into a play and you write a lot of parts for for women because the women are in the amateur theater. Mm -hmm. And... And then you, if you write about 20 of them, you, you've got a, an income for the rest of your life. Well, I wrote one called Pioneer Go Home, which I, if you asked me what it was about, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> and, uh, it, it was pure sweat, and uh, every once in a while I get a royalty on it for like 33 cents or something. <laughs> <laughs> it never came through in the way that it, it was going to give birth to other ones and... Uh, uh, I don't know how you found that. I th I thought it was done away with. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I I try to be informed on my subject, so I, I I took it upon myself to do do a little research, and uh, I, I know that 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 uh, was adapted, if I'm correct. Uh, in, it served as the basis for Follow That Dream, the Elvis Presley vehicle, which was. Uh, released in 1962, which which does have a fan base. A lot of people say that they think that's one of Elvis's better better starring vehicles that he did. I had no idea that was the same story. I really didn't. Yeah, well, that's. <laughs> I just it, it learned. It sprang something. from you. <laughs> it sprang from okay. you, and uh, so you have a connection to Elvis. Now you know. So. <laughs> they were they were talking at one point about my writing a story about this young singer from the South who happened to be Elvis Presley, but it never came to pass. Mm -hmm. uh, that would have been interesting. We were about the same age, I think. No, I was a little older. Yeah. So that's, uh, that, that was the, um, of course, and it was a couple of, it was, I think, about 10 years uh, after your television, uh, your foray into television, that you actually got your first screenplay credit for Sweet November in '68. Uh, yeah. Did you have any screenplays before that that didn't get made that you had uh, sold, or I'm just curious? I had about, about 400. Oh wow! Uh, 
Well, we all did. You could you could do your ceiling with the rejection slips. You just had to deal with that. Uh, you you don't think they they mean anything, but if you read them, you can usually extract something of value that can help you the next time around. Mm-hmm. Uh, I uh, I don't remember. S- the first play I wrote was a little thing called Finkel's Comet, and uh, it went to uh, a young director named Sidney Lumet, who uh, directed my first television play, and it was very successful, and so I did, uh, oh, I don't know, a half a dozen more for uh, for William Morris and uh, Alcoa. It was... <laughs> It was a good time. It was a fun time. Yeah. Did Did you have any memories of uh, working with uh, Sidney Lumet uh, that you'd like to share? Just curious. We're big uh, fans of was, his work, too. Well, it, it, when you worked at Fox, <clears throat> excuse me, as an office boy or a messenger, you had a lot of odd duties to perform, like uh, we had our world premieres of our movies at the Roxy and at the Rivoli in New York City, and what we would have to do is go rent a tuxedo and get into the hired limo that the company hired for you and pull up at the front of the house as uh, front of the house and get the uh, star in this case it was sydney and uh, i remember him well and uh, i accompanied him and his wife to the theater and stayed in the car as he got out and got all the applause and uh, two years later, he was directing my play. That was that was a great kick. Oh yeah, that's that's fascinating. That's fantastic. Yeah, well, it's uh, fun. nice feather in your cap, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So now, Sweet November was the first one that actually got that was made that uh, that was filmed that that you had written and obviously launched your screenwriting career. I would say did. Uh, now, Robert Ellis Miller was the director of that, and he had also did the adaptation of The Heart is a Lonely Hunter uh, previously, I believe, or maybe it was after Sweet November. Um, it was around that time. But uh, I'm just uh, curious if you uh, were on the set when we, they were doing that film and, and if you had any memories of, of Sweet November when they were I had a lot of memories of Sweet November, a lot of good ones. Uh, first of all, I wrote it as a play originally, and uh, some uh, marvelous agent who was at MCA at the time, a big talent agency, and he got it and uh, brought it out to the coast, and they said, get this, it'll make a great movie. And uh, so they bought it, and it was never performed as a play ever. And uh, they just bought it, and I took this the theatrical script and uh, made it into a movie script. And you did a lot of things in those days that you never thought you would be doing, but it worked out, and, and Robert Ellis Miller did a fine job, and we had Tony Newley and Sandy Dennis who were just brilliant in it and gave the the story wings. Uh, they were marvelous. Uh, now, I know they remade that, and I, I wasn't sure if you were, uh, were a oh, fan I of... Not, I was not involved, and I was a little ticked off because it was the same producer who produced Sweet November, my version, the first version. Interesting. And we got marvelous reviews on our on our little movie, but these people just went down the drain with it, and people can't d- d- detect a difference between the two of them when they're told, oh, Sweet November is on. And it's been a source of uh, uh, unhappiness for me. Uh-huh. Uh but uh, a lot of worse things happen than that. But every time you do a remake, you you really look for trouble. The original is so good in many cases that it just keeps looking like you should never have played with it again. It's it's not new, and uh, uh, it happens all too often. But uh, I, I I was not prone to to like it, and and I didn't. <laughs> But I got a credit for it, uh, they said, based upon my screenplay, which I said, that's a credit I don't need. <laughs> well, you know, if if it didn't do anything else, I think it did do one, one thing uh, in your favor, and that is that it kind of forced 
the hand of Warner Brothers to reissue the original because it had been so hard to find. I know I just could not find it. Uh, it was just one of those films, unless it turned up on television, you just it was just out of circulation and then they kind of you know kind of shined the light on the original and they and they put it out there and now it's readily available uh and you can it's a, purchase it's a great it. favorite of of turner uh it shows up a lot on on that channel and uh that that is most pleasing to see because it was my first one and uh i have, I have a great affection for it yeah, and did both, you uh, and and Sandy and Tony are gone now, and every once in a while I look at that picture and realize how how good they were and how how they made me look good. And uh, that was that was just a great experience. Yeah, there's a there's there's a real uh, uh, I, 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 a chemistry I would say, but in their relationship in the film I, that that works in its favor. And and when you get to the uh, you know the the punchline, so to speak, at the end of the film that kind of tells you know, kind of uh, explains everything. It it really uh, they they just deliver it well. I think they do an excellent job, and um, yeah, it's 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 something you should be uh, sh- should be proud of. <laughs> was was there any basis in truth uh, for that? A great deal of my stuff is is autobiographical. Okay, uh, I don't want to go into that one, but there was a girl okay. involved. Uh, who was ill, and uh, that's how Sweet November happened. Okay, yeah. Well, that's 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 interesting to know. So, uh, and I noticed that your next credit is uh, Can Hieronymus Merkin Ever Forget Mercy Hump and Find True Happiness, which was directed by Anthony Newley. And I was wondering if uh, th- that's one that's a blind spot on my. Uh, I, I have not seen that one. It is hard to find. And uh, I know Anthony Newley directed it, and I, I didn't know if uh, that came as a result of your collaboration on Sweet November there. Tony, Sweet November came first, and Tony was the first mm-hmm. actor I'd ever met who who committed to doing the movie but insisted on meeting the writer. And so suddenly there I was in, in the anonymous East, and I'm told to go see Tony Newley out in L.A. and discuss the script with him. Mm-hmm. And I think, oh, hell, he's going to give me hell on this one. And he didn't. He just said, look, I'm an Englishman, and I want to understand these lines. Uh, you, you've you kind of rewrote them for for me, but there are things I don't understand. I want, I want you to read my part. And so, so we had a session where he read all the other parts, and I read his part, and we became great friends. And from that, uh, we worked on uh, Aronimus Merkin, which is really all Tony's. Uh, if you're familiar with his musicals like Stop the World and uh, oh, yes. The Roar of the Grease Paint, they're, they're all about totems in his own life. And uh, he had this screenplay, and it was a mess. It was talent all over the place, but it, it had no no wheel. It it, it wasn't turning. And uh, we worked on it, and Tony, who was so generous, gave me full credit on the screenplay, and I won a British Writers Guild Award for the Best Original Screenplay of the Year, and Tony made sure that it was given to me. And all I did was... Uh, Keep it sane, uh, but Tony. Tony was so gifted that he was he, he would explode on the screen if you let him, and uh, he could do that in the theater. But you you got to hold him down a little bit. The picture did not please Universal, and uh, I don't think it was properly released. And the ratings were young and new in those days, and. Uh, mm-hmm. It, uh, I perhaps have the only print, and I'll show it to very few people because you won't understand it. <laughs> it's uh, it's, it's uh, in the middle of a movie. You're going to see a commercial, which the star plays a featured role in the commercial. I mean, it's just these are all Tony's ideas, which I was primed to always bring down a little bit so that it would fit. 
Mm-hmm. But he was he was great. We became great friends. Wow. Yeah, that's uh that film is a curio and uh like I said it, it like you said it is hard to find and I I would I personally would like to see it being uh, a fan of your work uh, but it's just it's it's very difficult to to locate and um maybe someday <laughs> maybe, maybe someday. someday maybe someone will drop it off and run. <laughs> Well, well, uh, things picked up at the beginning of the uh, decade of the 70s for you with Watermelon Man, which uh, has a definite cult following and is uh, yes. referenced still to this day. I hear people talking about that, directed by Melvin Van Peebles. And yes. uh was uh, wondering what the genesis of that one was. Well, I wrote that uh, screenplay. Uh, it's an original, and it was about white uh, hypocrisy mm-hmm. and uh uh columbia bought it but it, 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 we're talking very early in the, in the 60s columbia was afraid to make it without a black director they they felt very strongly we'd love to make this film but we don't want to go out there and have it made by somebody and and have him fall on his face for whatever reason and they found Melvin had written a uh, a little movie and directed it himself in 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 Europe called uh, Three Day Pass. So Melvin was given the reins of uh, Watermelon Man, and he and I immediately disagreed <laughs> on just about everything. Cause he saw it <laughs> as a picture about black power, mm-hmm. and I saw it as one about white hypocrisy, and that that's a tough mix. But somehow. It worked to a degree that gave us a picture we could release with some confidence, and it did become a cult film. And uh, oddly enough, I was informed that I was nominated to be one of the black writers of the year, and I had to inform them that I was not black, but I'd be (laughs) pleased to be nominated. So they quickly pulled my name out of nomination. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it came along at an interesting time. The time was right for a film like that, and of course, uh, and Godfrey Cambridge, you know, who another one who died way too soon. Uh, actually, yeah. yeah, actually, only five or six years after that came out. Uh, yeah, he, he was a very funny man, and the concept was uh, odd. It's about a, a white man who, because of his bigotry, is turned black, and he has to deal <laughs> with it. And uh, it's funny, but it's also got a bite because he becomes uh, aware that uh, it's not so easy to just be a different color. Uh, I I don't know. I'm I'm so pleased I wrote that, but uh, I wish Melvin and I had gotten along better. The man is gifted. I don't I don't know what happened to him. I hope he's still out there, but uh, uh, he. Uh, he saw it differently than I did, which is not unusual in this world. Yeah, he's uh, he's uh, he, he's still he's still among us. Uh, he's he's still out there, but uh, he, I guess it was the film he made after Watermelon Man that kind of cemented his reputation. The Sweet Sweetbacks badass yeah. song, That's and right. that was the following year, which uh, that has been documented. Uh, many times in many places the production of that film uh but uh so so watermelon man was was obviously a very solid credit for you and then that uh of course the next year was the film that we all know you for the summer of 42 of course and uh i was just uh, curious to see how that um if that script had been sitting around for a while before it actually was uh, picked up uh, and greenlit by Warner Brothers, or if, or if it was if it went in there fairly quickly and got done, uh, I was just curious about all that. Well, you're about to hear the reality. <laughs> okay, it great. Took about seven years and over 35 rejections for it to happen, and uh, it was. Motivated by my, my my buddy who I grew up with, who was killed in Korea mm. on my birthday in 1952, 
and I decided I'm going to write about Oski one way or another, and I did, and the picture, the script languished a lot until there was Bob Mulligan, who we sent the script to, and he said he'd like to do it. And he took it to Warner Brothers, who was in need of some product. They they had some new management. And uh, Bob had given them a budget of a million dollars. That's all he saw it cost. And uh, he, he said it was a very small cast. And, he saw, and so they didn't even read the script or look at the budget. They just told Bob because of... Uh, to Kill a Mockingbird success, they they wanted him as a filmmaker for Warner Brothers, and uh, he committed to the film. And we were off and running. We had no rain. We shot on the West Coast and made it look like the East Coast. We had vintage cars, salt box houses, like like in New England, and mm-hmm. uh, everything worked. And the people in power looked at it and said it has legs, which is, as you may know, it's saying the picture could run for a while. Mm-hmm. And uh, we scored really good. And uh, the fun thing that happened was after the picture was shot and is is going through a year of getting um, opticals done and the music tracks and all of that stuff, it takes about a year, if you do it right, mm-hmm. to get release, somebody said, why don't you write a book, and we'll get the book out ahead of the movie, and uh, it'll help publicize the film. I said, I I don't know how to write a book. They said, well, write anything. So (laughs) I sat down, and I wrote anything for about, I would say, six to ten weeks, and the bloody thing became a bestseller. (laughs) So when the film is released a year later, it was, it, the, the ad line was based upon the national bestseller, as though <laughs> the book came first. Well, the book came second, but nobody knew it. <laughs> yeah, that's a popular misconception that people uh, they they think it was based on a a, a book, and and it was. I that that is an interesting story of how. Well, in this case, the book did come out first, but it was written after the movie. Yeah, was right. Shot. Anyway, so, that was. We had Mulligan at his best. He took a, a fragile screenplay, uh, three young teenage boys, a beautiful young actress who had only appeared in one film, and he uh, he came out with a winner. We were all so impressed with Bob. He, he had a magic touch. He sure did, and, and he really just had a real gift for working with... Um with with kids, you know, yes, he did. Uh, I, I think he did because I think back on you know To Kill a Mockingbird, obviously, and then your film Summer of '42, but then the other, and um, later on Man in the Moon, which was the film debut for uh, Reese Witherspoon, you know, and she was a teenager, I think, when that was, and just all of those are just he just had such a knack uh, for working with with kids. It just seemed like he could just really pull great performances, and I. And I think Robert Surtees, who photographed Summer '42 and some of his other films, was uh, he, what he brought to the uh, to the plate to the project. Well, we had we had four nominations. I Surtees was one of them, mm-hmm. and then we had Michelle Legrand to write the music. And Michelle is nothing less than a genius. Uh, he he just is more. He's done three films which I've written, and all of them had the best music imaginable. Mm-hmm. This marvelous stuff. I agree, and I was curious about that because I I, I know that there were uh, that he had scored uh, more than one of your films, and I thought, well, I wonder if there's a relationship there between you all, or if that was just coincidental that that happened. No, he's since said to me a number of times, we want to do Sweet November as a musical on Broadway. Mm Mm-hmm. But the pyrotechnics of the contracts are so weird that nobody knows what to do about it. And Michelle and I have frankly given up on it. And uh, I know how to do it, but uh, I've given up so many of the rights when I sold it to Warner Brothers. uh, I gave it everything because I was about to become a father and I... 
I wasn't the richest man in the world at the time, and the money they offered seemed monumental. Mm-hmm. So I grabbed it, and, and uh, to my regret, eventually, because uh, it did have another life, I thought, and, and so did Michelle. But we never could do it, but uh, that's that's another story that uh, we don't want to go into. <laughs> uh, Summer 42, I know it's based on autobiographical experiences that, that you had, and, and I... I um, Realize, or I have uh, read that uh, the real Dorothy actually contacted you at some point when the film was uh, in its original release. I think around that time that you actually did make contact with her. Uh, well, maybe she had left me a note uh, reassuring me that uh, my life would be fine if, and she had confidence in all of that. Uh, and that was the end of it until years later when I grew up and, and wrote the, the movie and, and the book. Mm-hmm. She, of course, found out about it. How could she not? <laughs> and uh, uh, sent me a little note, uh, something to the effect that uh, the, the ghost of that night 30 years ago are better left undisturbed. Ooh. And she she didn't want anybody to know it was her, and and I I often wondered about that. But my friend Oski, who was very bright, mm-hmm. knew it at the time. He said, "Herm, if she ever revealed her name, she could have been prosecuted for prosecuted for having sex with a minor." And that had never occurred to me that that she was committing a crime. <laughs> by uh, betting me. And uh, so that's uh, one of the reasons why I never wanted her to be discovered. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't know where to find her. Anyway, I never knew her last name. Lord knows I was 14. Warner Brothers made me 15. They thought 14 was too young. <laughs> I was 15. But... Uh, the, the, the she reassured me that uh, she had remarried and was a grandmother uh, in that same one letter. So, so I felt better about that. And uh, but that was, as you might imagine, a, a traumatic event. Oh yeah, uh, uh, that's. Uh, and I know that back in those days when we didn't have, uh, you know, the world was. Uh, a lot larger now. It's a lot smaller with the internet and all that. You, it wasn't so hard. It wasn't so easy to connect with people uh, that came and went through your life, and, uh, and you know, it's people could easily just uh, leave your life and you might never see them again. And I always thought that that was so poignant. You know, the the in the film that uh, you know the, the coda at the end that you never saw her again and all that. That just that just kind of nails. That's what makes the movie what it is, uh, you know. And it's just interesting that that you did uh, finally get some sort of uh, connection with her before, you know, because it it is kind of sad to think that you would never reconnect with someone again. <laughs> well, people have over the years sent in and wanted to rewrite it and take the uh, what happened next or what happened afterwards, even including. One which was very well written, uh, where Hermie grows up <laughs> and he marries Dorothy, but I felt, that, fellas, that that's a little too much. <laughs> I, I I don't think that's going to work, and I, I can't do it. And uh, since it's my property, I'm I'm not going to do it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's better, left alone. it's better left alone. The the coda at the end. I tried to sum it up that uh, uh, life's filled with different things, and wherever we go, we leave something, and we always take something with us. And mm-hmm. and I told her we we raided the Coast Guard station, and we had nine days of rain, and Oski gave up the harmonica, the harmonica, and, and that in a strange way, I, I lost Hermie forever. Mm. And uh, that sufficed, and and it was the end of the story, even though. 
you you might say, gee, let's see more of those people, but you can't. It doesn't work that way. It it, it could have been watered down by doing some more on it. Yeah. Uh, I I uh, I was happy to leave it alone. Yeah, I think you made the r- right decision. We did the sequel because Warner Brothers felt that the the sequel to the original that did well, you you score at least one third of the gross money that you would, and we did. We scored one third, but it was about the boys at out of town college, and I had never gone to an out of town college, and so it, the screenplay lacked that dynamism that the 42 had because I knew all about 42 because I was there. Mm-hmm. Whereas the sequel was absent and uh, I'm not sorry we made it, but I understood immediately why it didn't work. Yeah. I, I mean, from a personal perspective, I, uh, I, I enjoy seeing the characters because I love them so much. And, uh, you know, it's nice to be able to spend some more time with those characters. Uh, so I'm thankful that we have that opportunity, but it doesn't, it just doesn't quite uh, match up to the original. There is, you know, there's, um, there's, there's just something uh, missing. But, uh, but having said that, it is, uh, there are, uh, it's, it's just nice to be able to have that extra time with those characters. And so, so I am grateful that, uh, that they went ahead and that you participated and, and did that, and um, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure that was uh, the first thing in their minds was to try to <laughs> recapture that success. <laughs> but you, well, it is, it, the, the one who did it better than anybody was The Godfather. That oh, yeah. worked, but but most sequels just leave a little bit out, and you never know what it is because yeah. it's impossible to find it. The dynamism all over again. It just mm-hmm. not happen. Yeah, and, and if it, I, it, it's a shame that nobody knew Oski. Oski won the uh, uh, Silver Star for uh, bravery. He he was a medic and he was he was treating a wounded man when he was killed, and the man oh. lived. And, uh, uh, he was just twenty four, and. Uh, mm. Who's going to be a doctor? He was he was so funny and so bright, and uh, the boy who played him uh, was so good at it that uh, he became Oski in my mind. Oh, I'm, all the boys are in their sixties now. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> yes, and, I, and yeah. if one way or another, they're in the business somehow. <laughs> yeah, I actually have a uh I I have had some contact with Oliver Conant who uh plays um Benji. Uh we we've had some correspondence from time to time and uh he's he still does he directs a lot of uh theater, I think. Uh That's right. I, I spoke to him a, a couple of years ago on our 45th anniversary. Uh they all called me including Jennifer O'Neill and Oski and uh Benji and and uh, I'll be all right. And Hermie, they mm-hmm. called me to wish me well and all of that. And uh, he he was it was a very great kick because nobody nobody expected that from our film. Nobody. That's great. And, well, we'll we'll get into uh, just a couple of other ones, and uh, I won't take too much of, uh, more of your time. But I did want to talk about uh, "Remember When," which was a TV movie uh, from 1974 that starred uh, Robbie Benson, and it uh, it had a also a, a backdrop of the 1940s as a setting. And I and I do think this was supposed to be a television series, or this was a pilot for a series that never made it. And it has Jack Warden in it. He gives a terrific performance. I'm a big Jack Warden fan. Uh, also, and I just wanted to uh, get you to talk a little bit about that. And um... well, there is a story. I don't know if the world is ready for it, but uh, the Danny Thomas people wanted to make the movie about the home front during World War II, mm-hmm. and so I was the king of the '40s at the time. So they asked me to do it, and so I wrote it. And uh, the interesting thing about it was. It it did what it was supposed to do. 
But we cut to the USO to show local talent that people want to remember those days where soldiers could come and local people would would uh, entertain them as best they could. And in, in cases of Hollywood and New York, with, or there were stars who came in, and all they served were donuts and coffee. And uh, when you do, when you do a pilot film, you're competing with about 20 other films who mm-hmm. are who are looking to become a series. And we were no different. And so what happens is. There's a little thing hooked up in in the chair in front of you if you're in the audience, and it's got dials. And if you turn it one way, it means you like what's going on, and if you turn it in another way, it means you don't like what's being done. And I wrote the uh, the USO scenes where local talent comes in, and I didn't want professional people. I wanted people who were not all that good but just were trying hard. Mm-hmm audiences that we invited in to rate the film didn't like it so they're writing they're turning the dial left and it adds up to the negatives am i making my point i i don't know if i yeah i think so we were weighed down with a lot of negativity when it was done by design and we were competing against uh oh my god a little house on the prairie and uh, the Rockford Files, I mean, there's some big guys out there, and we just got lost. And and so when next time I do that film, I'm going to have I'm going to have Beyonce in there, and I'm going to have all the big stars come in and sing at the USO, and their dials will go in a different direction. <laughs> That's a great idea. That That might be right for a remaking. I'll try it if they want to. <laughs> That's a good idea. Uh, so, so we'll we'll cover just a few more, uh, right quick. I, I was curious about Ode to Billy Joe. Uh, I know recently on a podcast, uh, I heard Max Baer talking about uh, that he wanted to do a film of this, and he he said uh, that it just occurred to him that uh, he wanted the guy that wrote Summer of '42 to write it, and so he got in touch with you based on <laughs> that he was a fan of Summer of '42. So I was curious to. Uh, to, to hear your side of that story, and uh, this this film also has a lot of fans, by the way, to Billy Joe. Well, Bobby Gentry was a, a star, and she wrote mm-hmm. Ode to Billy Joe, and at that time, it was the biggest selling hit record of all time. Mm-hmm. So everybody wanted to make a movie of it, and Max got the rights to it from Bobby. They knew each other for some one way or another. And so Max gives me a call, and he says pretty much what you just said. He said, I I love Summer 42, and I think you should write this. I said, Max, thank you so much, but I'm a little busy, and uh, I I don't know the South to any great degree, and uh, it's all about the South, and et cetera, et cetera. And he kept asking me to do it, and he kept after me. And finally he said, what will it do to get... And so I finally said, Max, send me a check for a hundred grand, and I'll write you a screenplay. I just wanted him <laughs> off my back. I never thought he'd do it. Don't you know the check arrives? And, <laughs> and I'm working with Max, who is a marvelous guy, but he's a little bit nuts. But enthusiastic and talented, and his father was heavyweight champion of the world. At yes. Once. And Max was just as big. And you don't want to get into too many discussions with Max because he's big. (laughs) Well, I know that uh, based on the success of this film and making County Line, he he pretty much uh, stopped making films because he was successful enough with those two. So obviously it it did pretty well. And it was another Warner Brothers production. And... uh, and not only did he hire you to do the uh, the scripting, but he also got uh, Michelle Legrand for the music, of, yes. of course. So, <laughs> well, what what you don't know is that uh, uh, I did this. Uh, I insisted on meeting Bobby to find out what the lyric was all about. Mm-hmm. All I know is that it said Billy Joe McAllister jumped off the Tallahatchie Bridge, 
and yes. his references to her brother and Brother Taylor, the local pastor, and all those people. And I asked Bobby, I have to write a screenplay. You tell me what your story is. She says, I made it all up. It's about nothing. I said, I beg your pardon. <laughs> you don't know what it's about? She says, no, nobody does. I just put those names in there. So I thanked her for, for nothing. And I went home and made up the story about Billy Joe McAllister. I just, it was sheer fiction. Wow. And That's... people thought that that was the story behind it, behind the song, and it's not. But it was a very strange movie, and it was very well done by some very good people. And uh, Max was fun to work with, but he's uh, he's volatile. We were <laughs> doing some casting down at the University of Mississippi. We shot the whole thing down in Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And uh, Max and I were in a Ramada Inn, and we were arguing about the script, and uh, he... He got, he's drinking all this red wine and his, the whites of his eyes are getting red and I'm getting nervous because he's nearer to the door than I am. And uh, that's not a good idea with Max. So he looks at me and he says, you know what? You're a bully. I said, I beg your pardon. He said, I'm bigger and stronger than you and I could pummel you into oblivion. He says, but you're smarter than me and you're using it as a weapon. I said, look, I tell you what, let's pretend that you already knocked me down, and I'll lie down on the sofa, and we'll <laughs> talk about what our ideas are. And he looks at me, and he says, you're doing it again. <laughs> <laughs> so I got up and went over and turned on the water spigot, washed my hands, and tried to get near the door. But he was harmless, really, and... Uh, he had some good people, and we we had a nice film. It was a good film. Yeah, and it's the second time that uh, Robbie Benson, who was also in Remember When, he has the lead in uh, Ode to Billy Joe as well, so that's the second time that he had uh, participated in a project written uh, by you, and um, so so that's kind well, I of... Looked, the... I, I knew Robbie was going to be in this, in the, uh, in this, in the, uh, pilot. I, I wanted him there. I knew what he could do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I certainly wanted him to be in, in Billy Joe. In, uh, yeah, Billy Joe. I tried to write a different script and I, I tried to write a different book every time. So that, I mean, I had so many offers to write about Summer 42 again. Write about the boys again so that there would be a series of books and movies and mm -hmm. I just didn't want to do that. That would be to just stifle me. I just wanted to go to a different area each time, and and for the most part, I did. Didn't always work, but for the most times, it did. Yeah, it's uh, there, there's always uh, people who who want more of something that they enjoy so much. But sometimes, like you said, it's best to just leave it alone because the the memory, the fondness of the original experience can is sometimes diluted when you return to the well sometimes I, and that's absolutely right and it's a big risk that you take you you make the uh, original look poor yeah However, this is true we, we, we didn't do that and uh i i i have very few regrets that uh i made some bad decisions along the way but i managed to stay in the east I, I I was not a, an Angelino. Uh, <laughs> I live in Connecticut, and I'm happy to be here. Good. Yeah. Well, uh, everybody has to figure out where where they're best suited, and sometimes the writers are. I think uh, those who write for a living, it's sometimes best uh, not to be so close to the industry. Sometimes it can be good to have that uh, distance, I believe. But. But one more thing I was curious about, if you don't mind talking about it, is uh, The Other Side of Midnight, which is based on the Sidney Sheldon novel, and you, you adapted that, uh, and I think that was moderately successful, or maybe very successful. But uh, well, you, you got it a little bit wrong. Financially uh, successful, I should say. <laughs> I well, the, the book was a runaway hit by Sidney yeah. Sheldon. And then when it came to do the movie, 
uh, my name came up, and it interested me because I don't do many adaptations. Right, I, I was curious. Original, and I met with Sydney, and and uh, we we uh, tackled this one, and I I did the first draft of the first hour. It was going to be a mini series of about eight shows. That was mm-hmm. popular in those days. And uh, I did the first one, and they hated it. And I said, fine, you can hate it all you want, and I hate it too, because I didn't want to write it that way. So I wrote it my own way, which I still think would have been the way to do it, but they didn't. And so I got credit for the first hour, and other writers (laughs) came in and finished it. And... uh, I, I used the pseudonym because I didn't want my name on anything on that project. And oh, I came up with the name. I took Shakespeare, where the line is, Alas, poor Yurik, I knew him well. And I came up with the name Paul Yurik because it <laughs> sounded like Alas, poor Yurik. And so the name that you see on that, if you ever see that uh, series, You'll see that the, one of the credits is Paul Urich. That's me. <laughs> anyway, uh, I tried, and it doesn't always work. Uh, I was ill-advised. It's a it's a big novel, and it's mm-hmm. it's uh, heavy-handed in 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 many ways. And Sidney was very gifted. He could write comedy. He could write drama, and. Uh, we tried, and uh, the, the boys who followed me were no more successful. The, the, uh, the piece was panned uh, pretty much, but uh, I, I get, there were things in it which were good because the book was good, mm-hmm. and they survived. But uh, you, you just can't love everything you do, and you have to be man enough to admit it that maybe you shouldn't have done it. <laughs> well, not all of them can uh, can be runaway smashes or or, or creatively uh, uh, successful. So, uh, you know, artistically, but um, yeah. But I noticed T- Daniel Taradash was one of the other writers on that that got credit, who wrote from here to eternity in Hawaii. He was a co-writer on that. So he was this... first writer, by the way. Oh, interesting. And he was also president of the Writers Guild. Oh, how, well, how they got him to to leave the script is beyond me. <laughs> but uh, he was he had done a draft which I never saw, and I never wanted to see it because when you're assigned to write the same thing, you don't want to look at anybody else's work for fear that you're going to echo it in some way. <laughs> True. And I didn't do that. Well, I was yeah, I was curious because I know that you have not done that many adaptations of novels, and uh, there is there there has been a story that you got that you did some uncredited work on the Great Santini. I didn't know if there was any truth to that or not, or if that's just some sort of a. It's, uh, there's a, a little bit of truth to it. Uh, a writer named Louis John Carlino, who's a very yes. fine, wrote the screenplay for the movie, which was a huge hit. And they were going to say, let's do it as a TV series. And they asked me to do it. And I was signed to do it. And I wrote three or four outlines. And then the whole project came crashing down. Don't ask me how or Hmm. why. I was never heard from again. Nobody ever asked me, are you still working on it? It was like it never happened. And... Oddly enough, Wikipedia, is that the name of the company? That's correct, yes. They had me down as, as the writer of the of the novel or the movie. <laughs> and I'm constantly given credit and I was I was speaking at some place, I don't remember we where, and I was introduced and my credits were read off and included was the great Santini. And so after everything was over, some young man comes up to me. He says, Mr. Rauscher, of all the things you've done, I love the great Santini the best. (laughs) That's terrific. I didn't write it. (laughs) 
He he was floored. He thought maybe I was kidding. But I <laughs> I never wrote that book, and I probably could never have done it any better than it was. <laughs> the hell of a good writer whose name eludes me. He's gone now. Pat Conroy, I believe, yeah. Oh, Conroy, and he wrote a couple more books. He's a brilliant yes. writer. Yes, he was. He, he was. He he was a great novelist. Well, listen, uh, I'm not going to take any more of your time. I do want to promote your website, uh, hermanrauscher.com. If anybody wants to, uh, any of our listeners want to go out there and see what you're up to, they can go there. And we want to remind people also that uh, a lot of your uh, books uh, are available as e-books now. Uh, in this digital age, you can actually get uh, digital copies of some of your works, and so we want to to want to, to make mention of that and make sure that people are aware of it. But uh, we we really really appreciate you taking your time. Is there anything else you'd uh, like to promote that you're working on, or are you just? Uh... No, I'm loafing these days. Uh... <laughs> well, you've earned it. You've earned it. <laughs> But I want to thank you for inviting me on. It's fun to talk about myself and have nobody stop me. 